Hi everyone, welcome to Peach Garage. Well, we're getting ready to build this 440 block and the board stroke it out to 500 cubic inches, putting out well over 500 horsepower. So, this is the first video in the series. Click on the subscribe button if you want to follow along as we put this thing together. It's going to be a lot of fun. So let's start with choosing the block, how to choose the right block, and what machining you're going to have to do and how much it's going to cost to get started building your engine. Let's get started. All right, so first things first. You have to find the block and get it. Now, when you're starting your project, obviously you're going to know what size block you need. This happens to be a 440. Uh, it's going in the 69 Super B. But whatever engine you're building, you have to try and find the block to start with. You could go and just buy a block. That's not too bad. You could pay up to $1,800, maybe up to $5,000 for a, a billet block, and you can buy a brand new block that way. Or you could try and find a block that... Um, it's a good starting point. And for some of these older engines, like these 440s, they were only made from 1965 through 78, so there's only 13 years of production. There's still millions of them out there, but you've got to find them, right? So you have a few options. First, you can go and find a salvage yard that has the engine or the block you need. You can call them up and say, hey, do you have a 440 or do you have a 350? And they might say, yeah, we have one here. And it might be completely assembled, which means you're going to have to go pick it up, in a truck, take it home, take it back to your shop, your garage, and you're going to have to take it apart. And if you break something while you're taking it apart, you're going to have to be able to take it back and say, oh, I broke something, going to have another one. So there is a risk when you buy a block and, or buy an engine, you bring it back and take it apart, you could strip some threads, you could uh, crack off uh, a couple lands or whatever, could, and if there's a bolt that's stuck and you strip that hole taking that bolt out, guess what, you're going to have to buy a new one. So that's, that's one route. Now you could buy something off of, you start going through Craigslist. Uh, you go through Craigslist and you're going to find everybody's going to have a block and they're all going to be great and they're going to say it doesn't, there's no cracks, it's perfect, you're going to buy and take it home and it's going to be just fine. Well, that's not entirely true and if you do get it home and you get back to your shop and you do find a problem with it, you're not going to call the guy on Craigslist and say, hey, guess what, uh, there's a crack in the block. He's going to say, well, it was, it was fine when I gave it to you, you must have cracked it and you're going to get in a fight. So Craigslist, while you can get some good stuff off of there, you're kind of on shaky ground. Just like eBay. You can go on eBay and you can buy and uh, find a block and it, the person could have good ratings for uh, selling, but once the product gets to you, you don't know what shape it's going to be in. Not only that, uh, you're going to have to pay shipping. Now, if you're buying an engine, a block, from somewhere in the center of the country and you're having it shipped to either coast, you're looking at least $300 of shipping. Uh, that, that means you're looking at if the block is 450 and you're paying 300 for shipping, you're on $750 for a block, which isn't too bad if you have a year specific engine or an older block that you're trying to get a hold of. I'm kind of lucky. I have, I'm outside of Buffalo, New York, and there's a place in Buffalo called Buffalo Engine Components. And what they do is they buy engines, transmissions, all kinds of tr uh, driveline components from Rex. Uh, salvages from insurance claims and then they, do is they, they tear them down and they sell the components Buffalo engine components so I can call them up and say hey I need a 5.8 liter 351 block they might have one now if I'm trying to be more specific I may not get it you're stuck with what inventory they have but when I built the block or built the engine for the Cobra engine I just needed a 5.8 liter block and they had one so I got it for like hundred dollars which is pretty cheap um, so I'm lucky in that regard but when I needed a 440, since they weren't made, since they were only made during that short period of time, they didn't have one sitting on the shelf. And what I'd have to wait for is a vehicle made from 65 through 78 to get in some sort of accident or go through some salvage for them to get the engine and tear it down. And I could wait three to six months for that to happen. The benefit is, yeah, I would get it cheaper, I wouldn't have to pay shipping, I'd go and pick it up. But when I get it back and I take it to the machine shop, if there's a crack or if there's something wrong with it, I might have to wait another three to six months. So I could be sitting for a year waiting for a block to start a project. The other option is go online and find places that have engine blocks. Uh, now I found this particular block in Kansas from the Mopar dude. Uh, I called and talked to him a few times and um, he's a really great guy to deal with. He was really, really helpful. Uh, but if you buy a block from him or any other reputable online seller of engine blocks, there's going to be a minimum amount of, it, of machining you're going to be expected or you should expect to do, like boring it out, doing a line hole, and surfacing the decks, things like that. So, once you've found a block, you want to decode the casting code, the serial number, try to understand more about where it came from, and then you have to have a machine. 
So what we'll do is, let's take a look at the serial number and the casting codes on this block. We'll do a little investigative work, we'll find out where it came from, when it was made, and I will, I've already had it machined. So I'll show you what I had machined, how much each part of that machining cost, so if you only need to have certain things done, you know what to expect and how much it may cost you. So let's get started. Alright, now here is the casting code on the passenger side of the engine. This is the back of the engine back here, front goes that way. Now, for Mopars, for 440s, Chrysler, what they did was, uh, I have marked here, you can see from late 71 into mid 72, late 72 here. What they did was for the casting number, they usually started with the 3.6 for late 71, 72, and this changes from year to year. And the four, four, first four digits are the, the uh, model number from 7172 and then the rest is a part number it got a 448 cylinder but you can see here that it's got a casting date the casting date is March 6th of 1972 so we know that this block was made early 72 although late 71 is when they really started using these numbers so it was probably the first part of the series where they started doing this uh, and you can see that the casting number is kind of embedded in there this number is kind of you can see like this embedded this casting and what they used to do is simply just put these numbers on a, uh, uh, on a small piece of metal set it in the sand and this would be cast into the sand that's how that worked now the other things you can tell from the block are this thing right here is called the, the, the casting clock this clock tells you what time of the day it was you can see it's kind of like uh, 12, 3, 6 and 9 o'clock this block was cast at 9 o'clock now it, although it doesn't have an AM or PM there is a dot here there's some other things here that you can't really read uh, and sometimes they'll have three dots here so you know it's first shift, second shift, third shift what time of the day it was but at least we know it was 9 o'clock um, I don't even want to venture a guess, but you can tell from the casting code, the casting code when it was made, made it March, you know that the part number matches that, it makes sense with that, the part number, and when it was cast. Now let's take a look at the serial number and we'll have a very uh, good idea of when it was made and how early in production. Now this is the block serial number. It's located on the passenger side, right along the pan rail for the oil pan. And as you can see, the number is 2C316, kind of looks like a 665, and this is how it's decoded. The first number, the 2, indicates that the year, so it's a 72. The C is where it was made. This block was cast at the Jefferson Street, Michigan facility, and the rest of the serial number is, it's number 316,000. So, as we looked saw earlier, it was cast in March, so by March they had cast at least 316,000 of these blocks and the way these numbers were put on here at the factories what they did is they just had a guy someone standing at the assembly line at the beginning and these numbers were put on there by hand and they'd have a stamp and hit it with a hammer and stamp that number into the block and that's how you end up with that number I've seen these guys do that job and it's brutal to do that job but that's what our number tells us it's a 72 built on Jefferson Street and it's 316,000 of these were made before this is block number 316,000 I think that's a 665 now let's talk about some general characteristics of a block the RB440 more power block just some general information so you can tell the difference just by looking at it now to start off with we have to dispel a few myths uh, not only with Mopar Chrysler but Ford and Chevy was the same way people got have the, this myth of that there were thin wall blocks thick wall blocks there were better years for blocks because it was a thicker wall so you could bore it out that is simply a myth if you think about it back during the 60s 70s when these blocks were made the casting technology wasn't great they were all sand cast and there was a lot of variation in the casting so if you got a block that was cast and, and the core of the, the casting moved during the casting process you could have a thin wall and that was just part of the natural casting variation which led to the crappy quality which why cars weren't that great back in the 60s and 70s but there's no difference between when you go from 65 to 78 you're not going to find a better block thin wall block thick wall block they're pretty much all the same but there were some changes in the blocks as the production years went on they made improvements for example in 69 they added the strengthening rib now this whole, this whole rib here and this whole strengthening rib that goes down the block that was added in 69 to make it a lot stronger that was a, a, a significant improvement because without that block it was done it was done for the 440s and the 400s but this block made uh, this uh, rib makes the block a lot, lot stronger uh, that was one of the significant changes, 69. Also, coming towards the engine, back of the engine, you can see how the top of this 
uh, rib here in the back where the, the transmission mounts is kind of angled down and it's just cast. Up until 72 it was that way, then they started flattening this out and changing the way this looks so it'll look different after 72. Also, um, 75 was a big year for changes from Opar. Uh, these mounting ears, or these lugs here, were changed. You can see how thin this is. At 75, they went to a much wider lug. This lug, if you have it blocked at 75 or greater, that lug right there will be a lot different. You can see that this is kind of thinner than the, the top part. In 75, this is widened out. So the ear, mounting ear on a 75 or, or older, 75 through 78, will be thicker. Also, with the coolant holes, you can see how we, how we have these round, round coolant holes in the top of the block. In 75, they did the same thing. They went to a, they could have, you, you might find a block that has a, like a dog bone looking coolant hole. The intent there was trying to get more coolant through the engine. So that was another one of the changes. So you look at the block, you can tell by the coolant holes that this is a pre-75 block being a 72. Now let's flip it over, let's look underneath. Now looking inside the block, I'm looking at the number two main right here, and there's a couple things that you can will, will notice uh, from different years. First of all, most blocks for 440s, the difference is, is in this web. So you can see this web here on the main. This web right here will be, will be between 1.9 and 2 inches, and the web over here on this side will be roughly three-eighths of an inch. So you can see how small it is over here. So the web is small over here and then it's, it's bigger on this side. The changes would be uh, roughly in 75 or so. These were increased and, and these, th this web was increased to make it stronger mostly for industrial type heavy-duty engines. But in 78 this distance here could be up to uh, well over three inches and this here can be well over half an inch so the earlier blocks will have a smaller web which makes them less strong in this area which is not really bad I'm not saying it's not going to hold it but if you're building a huge horsepower engine you might want to get a little later block 75, 76 through 78 to make sure that the webbing for the crank here is a lot stronger. That's the uh, significant difference or the significant changes that were done inside the block now let's take a look at the machining. Now the first part of the machining process when you get a block is to have it cleaned. You're going to have to have it degreased, magna flux it if it's an iron block, have it checked for cracks, install the cam bearings on the inside, put the soft plugs in or the core plugs in, have those installed, and prep the engine for assembly. All of that work should cost roughly 245 bucks. So $245 for the degreasing, magna fluxing, installing the cam bearings, soft plugs, getting it ready for assemble. Next, let's turn the engine a little bit. Next part will be boring and honing. Now the cylinders, depending on your engine, planning is important and looking up what parts you're going to use. You want to, if you're going to have, you're going to have to have the engine bored out. So you want to have your pistons ahead of time so that the, the bore can be matched to the cylinders that you purchase to account for variation in, in the machining of the piston. So next you're going to have to bore. Bore the cylinders. Now when this came in there was a significant lip on all the cylinders so these cylinders had to be bored. Not only bored because there was a lip but you have to make sure that they're perfectly round. So boring and then you have to have it power honed they put the, the uh, cross hatch in there and they have to do that with the torque plate on which means they have to put the crankshaft in with the bearings put a torque plate on the bottom of the uh, engine have it all torqued together so when they bore these holes and hone them they're held in the position as if the engine is torqued in position so the uh, the boring part power honing it all the cylinders with the torque plate bolted on there that should cost you about 250 or 260 bucks for that type of machining the next thing you're going to have to have is the deck milled, okay? That's going to be pretty uh, standard, pretty common to do. Now milling the deck is not as simple as just saying clean it up because you don't know how much they're going to have to clean it up in order to make it uh, smooth and flat again. If there's gouges, usually if there's a, a, a gap in between the, the cylinder head, if they blew a cylinder head gasket, there could be a big gouge in here. You'd see it and you'd have to machine that until it's all gone. You might end up taking five, ten, fifteen thousandths off your deck. If you do that, it's going to lower the piston or lower the cylinder head closer to the piston, which means you either have to get a thicker head gasket, a shorter piston, you're going to have to get a different cylinder head, but you're going to have to make up for that difference somehow. But at a minimum, two cleanup passes. If it comes over here with a mill, they do two cleanup passes and uh, do the mill 
on both sides for a V8 should cost about 150 bucks just to clean up the deck surfaces and what they're doing is they're making the deck surface clean you want a clean machine surface you want to make sure it's squared this way and that way so that it's completely perpendicular to the crankshaft that's what they're going to do for that the next thing is the bottom end regardless of what it looks like I highly recommend you get the bottom of the block line honed and that's to make sure that the crankshaft is going to fit in there nice and straight and if you're going to use your crankshaft after you get your crankshaft balanced and ground you want this nice and straight which is really really important so uh, something to share with you um, I just want to look at something real quick here uh, first of all this engine when it came in I'm going to show you one of the main bearings now the main bearing the reason that th this engine, I, I really had to have it line honed. I was going to have it done anyway, but when I got the block, one of the ma ma uh, main bearings, there was a spun bearing in there. And you can tell when you take it apart, first of all, you can tell by the grooves that are going this way, where, where the bearing spins in there, you can tell that's number one. And number two, there's a really sharp burr here that's probably really hard to see. But there's a sharp burr here to indicate that the bearing was spun. So that means that this was junk. So the task is, you got to find a bearing cap that's identical to the one that's in here and then you have to uh, put it on and you're going to have to line hone it anyway that line honing is going to cost about 150 bucks and uh, it's, it's necessary to do so 150 bucks for the line honing next let's talk about this is going to be a stroker motor I got a stroker crank so let's talk about stroker clearance now doing all the clearance work for a stroker crank if you think about it if they have the crankshaft in there and I want more stroke, I put a stroker crank in here, the crankshaft is going to move further, so that means it's going to go closer to the block and closer to the pistons. And I have the machine shop do this work because they're going to have it all bolted up with a torque plate. They're going to do all the line honing and have it all set up anyway when they do the milling. So I pay them, it's about 150 bucks, 160 bucks to do all the clearance work for uh, the, the uh, stroker crank. And what they do is, you can do this yourself, and I've often done this myself, but you can see how the clearance here is right on the bottom of the cylinder for the piston for the uh, crankshaft coming around so that the counterweight doesn't hit the block. And every one of these cylinders will have a clearance grind for the stroker crank in every one of them. Now on the mole pars and the front bearing towards the front here where the pickup is, this you can see there's a lot of machine that's done there because it's really really close with a stroker crank in these engines. So you have to grind that down. And you can see that this this uh, hole right here is uh, pretty close but it has to be done in order for that stroker crank to fit so while the engine is bolted up I pay for them to do the stroker crank uh, clearance fitting for the crankshaft and again it's like 150 bucks okay so all in all getting the block having it shipped here getting uh, the block degreased magnaflux clean getting the soft plugs installed the whole shot getting the deck done torqued up line honed cam bearings installed cleaned up clearance uh, clear, uh, machining clearance for the stroker crank and having all this stuff done costs about sixteen hundred dollars some of that work you can do yourself like the the uh, clearance for the stroker crank you can do that but while they have it done it's for me it's easier and it gives me peace of mind to have them do it also I, I talk about all the time in all my videos about having a machine shop you can work with having them do the work and having them available to you is a great help because as you go along you might get stuck and you might need your help and if they do the work they're going to be willing to help you if you did it yourself and you made a mistake well you're kind of on hook for it so we're all ready to get start building this engine we're going to start putting it together it's going to go pretty quick so click subscribe subscribe to my channel and you'll be able to see all the videos as i post them and i'm trying to crank them out as fast as possible hopefully one every few days if not at least once a week but you can also like my facebook uh, go to my home channel uh, to my channel and, and uh, click on the link and like my fan page for this because I'll be posting regular updates daily pictures as I go along so you'll see pictures and all you Mopar guys that are experts out there if you can add any uh, comments or help help us along as we're going the guys I never claim to be a, a Mopar expert but if you are a Mopar guy and you love this stuff and you know it and you can help everybody we're all here to help each other so leave us a comment leave comments on Facebook we can interact we can talk about it and we want to get started building this thing so I appreciate you stopping by I appreciate all your comments and thanks for stopping by Pete's Garage